A girl was sitting on a park bench, crying into her phone. I know, I know, I know, over and over again, she said. What did she know? Had she done something wrong? Was she being comforted on the other end of that phone? And then she said, crying with tears streaming down her cheeks, Mama, Mama, I know. She cried even harder. What would you do? What should we do? You're sitting on a park bench, and a young girl sitting next to you is crying. Do we get involved? Do we run over and interject ourselves into whatever's going on in her life, offering comfort or assistance, asking what's wrong? Or do we ignore? Do we pretend not to see and not to hear, mind our own business? It is harder, I think, to intervene than not to intervene. But it is much harder to choose to do either than simply do nothing and ignore and dive into our phones, scroll through Facebook, put our earbuds in and pretend not to hear the world around us. Our phone is perhaps the easiest way to avoid with our own dealing with our own discomfort. And what was her mother telling her on the other end of that phone? Never to stay out late again at night? That everyone fails every now and then? Was it even a real phone call or was she rehearsing the conversation she was going to have with her mother later that day? Was she all alone in the world? Did she need support? You're sitting there. What would you do? What should we do? Mama, Mama, I know. She put her phone down in her lap. She pulled her hoodie over her head, and she cried heavily into her chest. Now, I didn't hear this conversation. The writer, Jonathan Safran Foer, did. He wrote about it in an article in the New York Times about six years ago. And six years ago, I clipped it and I put it in my sermon file, <laughs> thinking one day we might need this message. Honestly, I think I'm six years too late. We need it now more than ever. The essay that he wrote was entitled, How Not to Be Alone. And in it, Ford tells this story to demonstrate something, something that I think we all notice, but haven't quite been able to put a name to yet. He told the story to demonstrate how technology, which was created to actually connect us to each other, encourages us to retreat from each other, that technology contributes in many ways to our loneliness. Four writes, the phone didn't make me avoid the human connection, but it did, it did make it easier for me to ignore her, to ignore her in that moment. Our daily use of technological communication has been shaping us into people that I don't think we really want to be. It's been shaping us into people that are more likely to ignore each other than to connect with each other. The flow of water will carve a stone, no matter how hard it is, over time it will shape it. Just like the currents that flow around us are carving and shaping our habits. Just as like all that is going on around us is causing us to be and feel and act in certain ways. And a funny thing has happened in this modern sea that we are swimming in. Have you noticed, because I have, that we have begun to prefer the poor substitutes, the poor substitutes for human contact and connection that technology provides, instead of the real human contact and connection. I see it all the time. I see it in my own life. I see it particularly in myself. It's easier. It's easier to make a phone call than to schlep out to see your friend in person. It's easier still to send a text message than to risk actually to have a face-to-face -face conversation with them. And it's perhaps easiest of all to send an email, maybe late at night, when there's no chance that they would respond. Sometimes they do, and you're like, what do I do now? <laughs> and you know when I notice this the most? I notice it when I'm texting my wife and my kids. When I'm texting them instead of calling them and talking to them easier sometimes just to text. 
technology that was created to improve human interactions, making it possible for us to reach someone that we couldn't perhaps ever have reached before in that moment, has actually become a substitute for human interaction and connection. And I speak from personal experience. Last month, I turned 49 years old. He doesn't look that young. <laughs> You're not saying that, I know. <laughs> Last month, I turned 49 years old. Nobody that is not related to me in my family called me on my birthday. Now, I have 5,000 friends on Facebook. There are 900, almost 900 families in this congregation. I got hundreds of emojis. I probably got 100 happy birthday messages on my Facebook feed. They all looked exactly the same. I think there's an app that does that. Some of my friends, they actually texted me. But as they were doing it, they were holding a device in their hand that was entirely capable of calling me in that moment. And they choose instead to type out, happy birthday, Dan. Nobody called me. Now, I'm not blaming any of you. <laughs> or any of them. There's enough guilt on Yom Kippur, that's for sure. But I do think that we're all responsible, not for forgetting my birthday, it's okay, but for missing that human connection that we all so desperately need, that we crave, that is the source of life, that nourishes our souls. The Torah tells us, Lo tov hayot ha'adam levad. It is not good for us to be alone. All new technology since the invention of the wheel has been disruptive and I think has been and caused a cause for alarm in its earliest days. The horseless carriage, the electric light bulb, I'm sure even indoor plumbing had its detractors early on. And in time, in time maybe people will come and look back at our days of sitting there looking at our phones instead of looking at each other and say, oh how quaint. What a bygone era that was. They had little phones, how lovely. They didn't have chips in their head or whatever. <laughs> but it seems to me that the closer the world gets to our fingertips, the further it gets from our hearts. When I turned 29 years old 20 years ago, there was almost no way to wish somebody happy birthday without actually calling them on the phone or writing them an actual letter or, God forbid, visiting them in person. I mean, Al Gore had just invented the internet a few months or years before that. He's made it into two of my sermons now. Even when we're out alone, even when we're out alone, we engage in behavior that almost ensures that we're going to remain alone in that moment. The next time that you take the Sky Train or you ride the bus, and I hope based on last week's sermon that we're taking the Sky Train and riding the bus a little bit more, look around you. Look around and see what's going on on that bus or on that train. You'll see, as I do, everybody's buried in their phones, heads down in their screens or ears covered up by their headphones. It makes it almost impossible to even engage in the very basics of a social convention or conversation. Is this seat taken? Do you have, do you have the time? You can't ask that of somebody if their head is covered up with earphones. Or perhaps the conversation starters that might lead to who knows, a cup of coffee later. Did you catch the game last night? I really like those shoes. Where did you get them? I do, Karen, actually. They're very nice shoes. <laughs> Henry David Thoreau wrote, city life is millions of people being lonesome together. City life is millions of people being lonesome together. We are missing out. We are missing out on one of the most fundamental and essential elements of what it means to be a human being. We're missing out on human connection. We're missing out on that feeling that we belong. It's harder now. It's harder to meet people. It's harder to have success at dating. I, I mean, I haven't done it in a while, but I wasn't so great at it then, but thank you, honey. <laughs> It's harder to actually enter into a conversation. That example on the bus happens not just on the bus, it's everywhere. It's harder to connect with people. Even though, even though we have more tools available to us now than probably ever in the history of the world. More tools for connection, but less connection. And look at our teens. And look at our adult children. They sit there texting on their devices, on their phones for hours on end. 
They're texting people that are in the same room. <laughs> but they're not actually with those people when they're there. And here's the really scary thing. Studies have found that many of them are just giving up. They're having less intimacy. Teenagers are having less sex. I mean, that's maybe a good, bad, I don't know, but it's never happened before in the history of the world. <laughs> They're having fewer long-term relationships. They're meeting face-to-face -face less and less. Harvard sociologist Robert Putnam wrote a book, a while ago, actually. The book was titled Bowling Alone. Its sermon, its title itself is a sermon. The premise of that title was that people he'd found in his studies preferred now to bowl individually, independently, rather than to join the leagues that their parents used to join. But he went beyond that. And so further in his book, he reached a conclusion. He said that we are feeling vaguely uncomfortable and disconnected. disconnected. We've changed our environment more quickly than we know how to change ourselves. We want to live in a more civil, more trustworthy, more connected society, more caring and collective community, but we don't know how to get there. He went on to say that loneliness is in many ways a state of mind. It causes people to feel empty, alone, and unwanted. I guess that's the definition of loneliness, empty and unwanted. Isn't it ironic, though, he says, that loneliness leads us then to crave human contact? But that very state of mind often makes it difficult for us to then connect with other people, to form connections. And this is no surprise to us. We're all students of the world. We're all students of each other. We see what's going on around us, even if our heads are buried in our phones. We've all noticed this dilemma that's been created over these last few years. We have a hunch, and we're right, that there's just something not right with our relationship with the universe anymore. It's not as rooted as it once was. It's not as meaningful as it could be. But we're not exactly sure why. We think our phones, but there's more to it than that. The Vancouver Foundation had the same question. They wanted to understand loneliness in Canada, particularly in Vancouver. They found that one in five Canadians is lonely. One in four in Vancouver. One in three seniors is lonely. They found that 50% of all Vancouverites find it hard to make new friends. That same study found that social loneliness and social isolation, they actually impact our physical and our mental health in really profound and, and, and dangerous ways. They found that loneliness, chronic loneliness, may shorten our life expectancy more than being overweight and being sedentary and not exercising regularly, they found that chronic loneliness is equivalent, in terms of shortening your lifespan, to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And why are we so lonely? I, mean, I almost kind of want to ask you to tell me, but there's a lot of you here. Why are we so lonely? I think part of it has to do with the changing nature of work and the way that technology has changed our work and our work environment. Because work used to be the place that we met people. I mean, synagogue and work. We used to meet people in, at work. That's where some of us made our best friends. Some of us made those friends so well that we ended up marrying them, and we're sitting next to them right now. The connectedness of the workplace is rapidly changing, and it's rapidly diminishing. People hop now from job to job. They work from city to city. They travel more. They're not in one place at a time. Steady work is harder to find. And you've heard of this gig economy? That's Uber drivers and DoorDash and people that do tech support calls from their home. My brother lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. My brother used to work in a building with a company with over two dozen employees. Now he works in his basement. Same company, same job, more or less the same employees. None of them are in the same room. It is not good for us to be alone. Or it tells us. We are the most social beings on the planet. We need human touch. We need the word of another. We need that connection. We need people, not pixels. There's a story in the Talmud about a rabbi who was a faith healer. This rabbi could lay his hands on somebody and heal them 
I missed that class in rabbinical school. They never covered it. <laughs> Tried. I can only get this to work. I can't get this to work. He could touch somebody, just touch them, and he would heal them. That rabbi, that faith healer, got sick. And so he called to his friend. He said, come and heal me. And then the Talmud stops the story right there. And it asks the question, as the Talmud will always ask a question. It asks, why couldn't this rabbi heal himself? It's a faith healer. It just touches and heals. Why couldn't he heal himself? And then the Talmud answers the question. And it says, because a person, a prisoner, cannot release himself from prison. A prisoner cannot release themselves from prison. When all you see all day is that glowing screen in front of you, it can feel like solitary confinement. I've felt that way. I'm sure you have too. Just staring at that screen all day long. And that's why real community instead of virtual community is so important, it's so vital to our survival as human beings. Because it keeps us tied together no matter what. It gives us a place and a people that we can count on. It's where we meet each other. Face to face and heart to heart, we get strength from each other. It's where people know who we are, and they miss us when we're not there. And if that theme song from Cheers is running through your head right now, it totally is through mine also. Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. I don't remember the rest of it, but you'll figure it out. <laughs> Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, he spoke here a couple years ago at Shard Sedek. Rabbi Sachs said that community is society with a human face. It's the redemption of solitude. Community is society with a human face. It's the redemption of solitude. Now, the root of the word synagogue is sin. Not that kind of sin. <laughs> S-Y-N. It's a Greek prefix. And it means or implies togetherness. The phrase that we use, the term we use for synagogue in Hebrew is a Beit Knesset, a house of ingathering, a house of assembly, a place where people come together. We call this a congregation because this is where we congregate. This is where we gather. Synagogues, synagogues came into being not for people to find God, but for people to find each other, for Jews to find each other. And that's why our tradition has, since the very beginning, required that we dab and that we pray in a minion, that we have at least ten people for our prayers. Because we want Jews to say those prayers together, because so often, the prayer that we so often say is, God, please release me from my loneliness. Please help me feel not so alone in the world. And the answer to that prayer doesn't come from God. It comes from those people that are standing around you, that are praying next to you. You're the answer to that prayer in each other. Think about our Shabbat Kiddush and our own egg. I know I probably shouldn't talk about food. You just started fasting. <laughs> but my guess is, is that you backfilled that a little bit, and you're probably nice and satiated right now. So we, we've got a little bit. That Kiddush, that own egg, I know it feeds our bodies, but you know. It nourishes our soul. The bagels, the lox, the schmear, that's just lubricant. It's not such great lubricant, but it's lubricant. It's lubricant for conversation, for connection, so that we can meet each other, so that we can get to know each other, to hear each other's stories, and for us to hold those stories as sacred to each other. So when we come to shul, maybe a year from now, maybe sometimes in between, <laughs> when we come to shul, let's make this place like the world we wish it was. Let's make this place as warm as we wish the world was. Let's greet each other. Invite each other to sit beside you. Unless you want to sit alone. I get emails about that all the time. If somebody wants to sit alone, let them sit alone. <laughs> Solitude's not the same as loneliness. Help people with a book. Help them find where we are in the service or the program. And remember, it is almost, if not more important, to say goodbye as it is to say hello. Because the essential, the essential thing is is that we need to see each other and greet each other and be with each other, panim al panim, face to face. That's how God met Moses on the mountain, panim al panim, face to face, not Facebook to Facebook. <laughs> so how can we know what's really going on with somebody if we can't look into their eyes and see their soul and hear their heart? 
Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan is a 20, 20th century American rabbi, maybe the most influential rabbi of the 20th century in the United States. He was the founder of the Reconstructionist Movement, but beyond that, he founded the Jewish Community Center Movement. He had the concept, the idea of the JCC. But he also believed in synagogues, too. And he said about synagogues that the primary purpose of a synagogue is to combat loneliness and to weld Jews who live in the neighborhood into a conscious community. To weld Jews who live in the neighborhood into a conscious community. Neighborhoods, that's the word that jumped out at me when I was reading that, because I think that those are places that are becoming extinct. I did a quick survey of our membership database before I wrote this sermon, or as I was writing it. We have 83 different postal code prefixes in this congregation. 83 different neighborhoods in our congregation. And that means that the function of the synagogue, of any synagogue, but of this synagogue in particular, is even more important. Because it's that unifying, unifying element that brings us together as a community, as a kahila kadosha, as a holy congregation, even more important than it was in Kaplan's day. And especially here in Vancouver, where we don't have 20 synagogues to choose from. Community is essential to Jewish existence. It's essential to the protection against loneliness. Now, we've come to know each other pretty well over the last six, seven years that I've been your rabbi. I mean, none of you called me on my birthday, but <laughs> I didn't manage to reach most of you either, so we'll call it even. And as we've known each other over this time, and I've been privileged to be your rabbi during that time, I think you've come to know that at least on the high holidays, if not at other times, most of my sermons have a call to action in it. A challenge for myself as much as it is for you to do something great in the new year. To change ourselves, as Mother Teresa said. Last week I asked you to save the planet, so I'm not going to add a whole lot to your list tonight. <laughs> but I do want to add one thing. One thing I think we can do to combat loneliness in the world, in our community, in our congregation, in our lives. Let's have coffee. One of the things that a synagogue can do better than any, I mean, we do prayer, we do holidays, but you know what we really do? What we do so well is we make connection. We build relationships. We are best at connecting people to each other and fostering, fostering meaningful relationships. And so we're going to use that technology that has been such a key to loneliness, we're going to use that to connect ourselves to each other. And so, yeah, there'll be an email after this sermon, too. <laughs> and in that one, it's going to have a very simple form. It's going to ask you to just put in a little bit of information about yourself. And if we all fill that out, we're going to collate them in the office and we're going to match you up with people and give you an opportunity that I hope you'll take to find a time and a place and go have coffee with each other. Just start with one. Of course, there's one condition for that coffee. You have to leave your phone in your purse or your pocket for the entire conversation. We're going to turn this technology on its head and we're going to use it, this loneliness inflicting technology, we're going to use it to heal and connect the human heart. We're going to use it so we can get to know each other better. Now, in all the days of creation, there was only one thing, only one thing that God said was low tov, only one thing that God said was not good, human loneliness. Low tov hayot ha'adam levad. It is not good for us to be alone. And if the synagogue is the house of God, then we have a responsibility that we can do, we must do all that we can to honor that message, to honor that commandment, to combat and confront loneliness that is so pervasive in our modern world. I want to end with one last story. And it's connected to that first story of the girl crying on the park bench. A mother sent her young daughter to the corner store to get some milk. About a half an hour goes by and her daughter hasn't come back yet. The mother gets pretty worried. Another half an hour goes by, it's been an hour now, and the mother is now frantic. She grabs her keys off the counter, she rushes to her car, she gets in her car and she starts driving down the street and around the corner to find her daughter. And as she comes around the corner, there's her daughter calmly walking back to the house. She pulls her car over, she leaps out of her car, she envelops her daughter in a hug, tears are flowing, the daughter has no idea what's going on. <laughs> Honey, where were you? I was so worried. 
Don't you know I was waiting there for you? I worried something had happened to you. Oh my God, I'm so glad you're okay. Tell me what happened. Where were you? The daughter realizes her mom is pretty upset here. She says, Mommy, I was with my friend. Her doll got run over by a car. And I was helping her fix it. Her mother calms down, breathes a little bit, and says, Honey, were you, were you able to fix the doll? And her daughter says, No, I couldn't fix the doll. So instead, I helped her cry. That's what we do here. That's what we do in relationship and community. We help each other cry. We help each other celebrate life's joys, and we comfort each other through life's oys. We see and we greet each other panim al panim, face to face, not Facebook to Facebook. In a room filled with about 1,000 people tonight, too many of us are alone. Too many of us are feeling lonely. Surrounded by 1,000 people, we're alone. 5,000 friends on Facebook feel alone. Lo tov hayot adam levad, it is not good for human beings for us to be alone. Each one of us can do something about that. We're the only ones that can, and we need to do something about that. In an age of loneliness, the synagogue, which is all of us, it's not the building, it's the people in it, is the most, I think, most important answer to that question of loneliness. We are the voice. We are the voice that answers when another soul calls out for companionship, and we answer. We answer, Hineni, I am here. I hear you. I see you. I'm there for you. You're not alone. Can he hear so may it be God's will. Amen. Gamarto. God, the 
Oh, my God.